Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Wolfgang Draxinger. I'm known as Datenwolf in the Munich CCC Alpha. And uh, today I want to give a talk which rose some, I don't want to say controversy, it, when it was announced on the uh, 27C3 FAR plan, uh, it spun a few very, let's say, pissed off block reaction. Or <clears throat> People never saw the slides, they just saw my abstract. So what is this talk about? It's called Desktop on the Linux. Uh, for a long time it has always been said, when will Linux arrive on the desktop, on the average worker's computer? Well, I think this time ha is long here. There are Linux installations in many organizations. Munich, the city network, is now running on Linux in a large number of clients. Uh, big universities have Linux exclusive uh, networks. Now, when I say Linux, I of course also mean BSD, but BSD is not as widespread on the desktop. It's more a server thing. And there's also Solaris. Uh, BSD and Solaris keep their distributions very centralized. So there is only a free BSD uh, distribution, only a couple of Solaris distributions. This is different to Linux where there's a wild bunch of things out there. First, two disclaimers. This talk is highly opinionated. Uh, this comes from my experiences working as a systems administrator. It is biased for being someone interested in clean code, small systems. Um, it's born out of frustration when the configuration of things that used to be very easy got, got very complicated. And I let vent my anger by taking notes what are the things that actually cause trouble. I was not just screaming in my small office. I actually tried to figure it out find the culprits. I'm not saying I got everything right. I've seen certain patterns. So, disclaimer second. Linux is not Unix. I'm fully aware of that. But I will mix those two subjects, those uh, namings in this talk, because they are very close. And for the matter of desktops, this just can be interchanged. Hope you're OK with that. No, there's someone in. Yes, I know, I know you're a BSD guy. OK, just so. As I said, I'm working as a systems administrator. I'm not the only administrator in our group. I work in a group of about 15 people uh, responsible for the physics faculty network of Ludwig's Maximilian Universität München. And we have something about 3,500 users in our network. So this is a pretty big installation. Just this one faculty. Then we have external users, which also get access to our network from the computer science, mathematics, uh, chemistry. This makes something about 20,000 users. And I'm known as the problem solver when it comes to the intricacies of uh, Linux desktops installations I used to write several drivers for them. They, they know I can do G, GUI programming, so everything, when something bad happens, they come to me, and I have to solve it. If I'm not hacking around in the university, I'm hacking for my pleasure, and my main interests are real-time graphics, real-time simulation, and systems programming, aka game engines. You cannot say that I'm somebody who doesn't like graphical systems. I love them. I really love working with highly graphical environments, animations, elegance, themes, styles. But moreover, it's more about highly optimized resource-aware code. This is something about micro-optimizations in some parts, algorithmic optimizations. And when these experiences from engine programming clash with desktop systems, and this is not just Linux, it's Windows, it's Apple, it's everything, then you get this impression, ah, oh, does it have to be that way, and well. And Linux is great because in Linux you think, okay, it's open source, you can't change everything. But these possibilities to tinker around, they are slowly fading away. 
Linux dist desktop di distributions have become evil, in my opinion. With desktop distributions, I mean OpenSUSE, Fedora, Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, the problem I see here is there is that they are more and more designed to accustom the uh, the DAU, the dumbest assumable user. So people shall pull, put in some CD, install it, just a few clicks, and then everything is made up. This is like Apple. <laughs> I don't like Apple. I don't like Mac OS. I can't think of it. <laughs> I'm not saying that Mac OS X is a bad operating system. It's just so uh, there is this facade, like in these Western movies, and behind them it's just a, uh, a few bars and so. So most of the problems we encounter uh, are attributed to automatisms. So things that things you put in a USB thumb drive and a nice icon pops up, or device auto configuration. Uh, Nowadays, we now know how to get these things right, but there are some legacy code in there which still messes with us, and it, there seems to be some people trying to thrive for compatibility. Good thing is these old zombies are eradicated. There's only one left, and even that one is going to go away. I think at the end of the next year, we don't see it anymore. Uh, it's no longer set and forget, and what I mean by this is set and forget for me as a system administrator. I used to edit a few configuration files, and I could keep them, carry around them, place them from the installation to installation, and things would work. They were tested one time, and I knew I would have no longer trouble. It's not the case anymore. So, to understand where the problems lie, let's look at something uh, a little bit segregated, but also from the same pattern, so multimedia. Uh, multimedia is a very, very hard thing. I'm doing graphics engines. They are very deep in this whole topic. And so you have your typical multimedia framework. And what it does is it builds so-called filter graphs. You can also call them processing graphs or whatever. Uh, this is so the usual scheme. Uh, these graphs can be placed around multiple libraries, code, or they can be in some monolithic system. Uh, but basically, it all follows the scheme input, demultiplexing my bit streams, decode every track, put, place them through filters for image enhancement, deinterlacing, replay gain, whatever, and then put, place it to my output devices. Uh, things don't play such straightforward always. So in Linux, we have a lot of multimedia frameworks, and I want to look at three particular ones. This one is called G this, this one GStreamer. It has a really big amount of modules in it. If you look at this modules list, it has every, about everything. Uh, file and forget graph generator included means I have here this small file, so I want to play this thing. It can be also an internet URL or something else. And with my default configuration for which output devices, this thing figures out how to play this thing. Problem is GStreamer, it's not really stable. It has a constantly changing ABI. Uh, with each version increment, you have to recompile everything. Yeah, OK. What? Yes, but. Not API, ABI. Neither. Neither? Well, it breaks every time I recompile it on Gen 2. <laughs> okay. GStreamer, let's say it's stable. Problem, I really love it. I love the ABI, API, how you use it. I would love to use it more, but it doesn't play as out as well, nice as I would like to. Then we have Phonon. Now, Phonon is not a media processing library in the classical sense, it's more like uh, some sort of remote control. So it gives applications a, uni un a unified API, and this API then can access multiple backends, among them GStreamer, uh, to build the actual playback change, chain, or it can also be recording, but I'm focusing on playback here. 
there is this feature built in Phonon Design that you can switch the back end and mid operation. Now, this is something I don't really understand because switching such in the mid of playback my whole media subsystems, this is difficult to get right. You can get it right, but it's a lot of work. Don't know why. Uh, there are some backends available. For Linux, these are Xena, VLC, and GStreamer. And the GStreamer backend of Phonon is unmaintained at the moment. The thing is, there are still some distribution, distributions which ship Phonon with GStreamer as default backend. Uh, and each backend has provide another filter graph building logic in addition to what the actual code in the backend can already do. So Phonon wants to build the graphs themselves. And then on most systems you will find Pulse Audio. Uh, Pulse Audio in itself is not a bad, bad idea. It has been designed as a better enlightened sound daemon. It mixes sound, provides audio capture to multiple clients simultaneously, and sound over network. So it's something like the audio equivalent to X11. It has become to some sort of media framework of its own. So you can do a lot of stuff you would normally would do in your uh, codec filter graph. Before you go to the output module, you can do this in Pulse Audio Server Side 2. And th the combination of these three things, phone on, GStream, and Pulse Audio, can have interesting results. So we have this functionality matrix. GStreamer can do about everything. And then there is this complementary functionality of Phonon on Pulse Audio. Say I want to listen to some music, and this is some... Yes? The last What? <laughs> yes? Uh, I mean, I You're Leonard? Yes, sir. Ah, okay, I wanted to ask if you're there. So Pulse Audio can do, not do full tone. <laughs> okay, but the, I can place. There is this, this huge number of. Yes, but uh, you can place about every um, uh, kind of plugins in. And if you want to mix audio, you it have to resample it. Are you sure you you have to resample it? But Pulse Audio is, uh, is solely and only a PCM, and everything well, else is done by okay. GStreamer. Let's say not filtering, but let's say uh, sample rate conversion. Also, at least on, on most machines uh, which use Pulse Audio, the device success is not done by GStreamer, so there's not really a duplication. But also, the graph building, as far as I know, Fano doesn't even do. Um, also, Fano is kind of dead and has been replaced by Qt Multimedia from Qt, and actually, it's being okay. paid for. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I mean, come on. Let's just say I have seen what's now coming in practice. So, well, it's already sold in devices and stuff like that, and it's actually not not dead or anything. It's actually maintained by by people who who knock your page. I'm not saying that, that GStreamer is not unmaintained. I say that the GStreamer backend of Phono yes, is. Yes, that's what I meant. But anyway, I mean, Phono is. Then they have to change this on their homepage because I looked just minutes ago and there's still this claim it's unmaintained. Well, yeah, sometimes you have to ask people instead of just <laughs> reading what, what's on the internet. Not everything that's written on the internet is true, you know? Okay. Okay. Good. You know, you could have written to me, but again. No, no. no. It's all right. Okay. Uh, well, okay. Say we're not doing filtering, but say we want to push the task of sample rate conversion to Pulse Audio. I think, Leonard, you agree that sample rate conversion in Pulse Audio is a good thing? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, what happens, I observed this myself, uh, we can recreate the situation, is say I want to play this uh, Warbis file with very low sample rate, little channels on a very cheap AC97, uh, audio hardware which only accepts a uh, 96 kilohertz bitstream at 24 bits, uh, bits per sample and six channels. There is this very cheap hardware in place which only uh, just takes this raw bitstream and ex expects the software or the driver to deliver the correct format. And now we let do Phonon do its magic. So it's, it's, Phonon says, okay, I want to play this file. Phonon is configured with GStreamer backend. 
uh, with a file source. And GStreamer has been configured to use Pulse Audio as a sync. So Phonon, uh, there happens this connection between Pulse Audio and Pulse Audio Server. And in the chain, it queries which sample formats can this audio hardware do by default. You can query what the hardware can do. And then Phonon fills it with GSTFF MPEG, says I have this input format, I want this output format. And now what gets get delivered to the Pulse Audio server is this large format, which is about uh, 10 times larger packets, audio packets, than we actually had to transmit to Pulse Audio server. If we would have only used GStreamer with its own filter graph builder, then it would have been aware that Pulse Audio Server can do sample rate conversion, but Phonon doesn't see this sync. So we have layers, including the deeper uh, layers from some higher level logic, and so we don't get the optimal uh, data path we would uh, like to have. So we're pushing large audio packets, and that means uh, large latency, and, uh, okay, you, you want to say something? Um, yes, I want to say Yes? <laughs> Speak up. Um, so, um, he basically can assign that. Hello? Yes? Um, so uh, uh, you're basically uh, um, complaining about the, the um, negotiation of the parameters, right? That's what you're saying. Well, the, the, there should be exchange, yes, but be, because of this multi-layering, there is well, no clean exchange. My simple exchange question happening. is actually: Have you filed a bug? <laughs> I guess that's a no. <laughs> I, I picked this as. I mean, I personally cannot comment on Fernand. I don't do Fernand. It's not a bug on your side. Pulse Audio does fine in this case. The problem is that the filter graph builder doesn't take all information into account because there are so well, many levels. Well, GStreamer filter graph builder does. And yes, the GStreamer filter, filter, filter builder does, but not the Phonon filter builder. As far as I know, there is no Phonon one. Phonon? I mean, but anyway, I don't want to discuss about Phonon because I don't do Phonon, but um, I really doubt that you're actually right well, on that. Well, I happen to have this on my system, and I was thinking, okay, what's going on here? Why is the latency so high? Well, I mean, there might always be bugs, but I'm pretty sure that they will not send us six channels if there's no point in sending us six channels. Well, because okay. Because that is a huge functionality problem. Can be. Let's just say this were old versions. This happened two years ago on my system. Wow, but is it today is today. Why are you speaking about it yet? Yeah, I, I said I would choose multimedia frameworks as an example about this multi-layering. I'm not saying that we can get things right. So, now let's get, go to some different place. Things... <laughs> no, 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 no. Now, I, I choose this as an example where you can see we have multiple layers, and these multiple layers not necessarily necessarily play well together. Can we agree about that? Um, can you hear me? Um, actually, I mean, uh, I'm a hacker of Pulse Audio, and I've also uh, contributed to GStreamer, and we actually work w very well together, and, and, and there are lots of products like... like yes, one, I know example. that they're working together, but it took a lot of work to get them work correctly. In, in, in fact, because there's a, a huge agreement be between the people doing all these not, not necessarily not Fernand, but Pulse Audio, oh, just I think you're doing and great work. And stuff like that. I think you're doing there great is work. No, there's really a tiny bit of duplication only, and it actually works very well together. But anyway. Um. Okay. Well, we have multiple layers stacked, and in my opinion, I think we should not have this deep layering. So, talking about layering. Logins complicated. Who of you knows the inner workings of GNOME Display Manager? Yes, I know you don't. <laughs> <laughs> then you can also tell, uh, confirm that there was a big change in the architecture around version 2.21. I 
do not maintain GDM, but um, I'm pretty sure it's not around that version, but it got a complete rewrite, yeah. It's got a complete rewrite. Well, the exact version, it's something around 2.21. I know that from version 2.21, uh, we had to adjust all our configuration files in our network. So tasks of a display manager, I think you know them all. Start X11 server, set up MIT cookie for X authority, show greeter, log in dialog, and optionally uh, allow for choosing the desktop environment and localization. Uh, this last part is seldomly used on a single desktop system, on a big scale network where people from different places log on regularly. It happens all the time. Uh, then historically these things also provide XDMCP. You should not do this today because it's insecure, there's no encryption. Uh, there are still some old X11 terminals around. Uh, we have them in the university, we still have to provide them with access, so we still need it. Sorry about that, can't replace them. Uh, user interaction is enter username, enter password, and that's the session type. That's it. So the login manager is an all a very short experience. So then why make these mistakes? DGM 2.21 and above are modal. You have to, to, to do two clicks if you're not going through the face chooser. So if you have a large user base with 3,500 users, you can't have a large face, face, facial chooser where people can click. A type of head search won't do well because the LDAP database where this is stored will not uh, be queried that fast. So we have to disable it. So there is only the small line, uh, only this other down here. And then there happens to be the last user uh, logged in visible too. And this causes confusion because uh, users tend to make mistake it for a screen lock. So they see, they see there's their login name from the last logged end user, and oh, this is locked, I get to the next terminal. So at the beginning of the day, people are somehow disappointed, everything is set up, and well, okay. Uh, then GDM2 starts a full-blown GNOME session. It does it for a simple login. I can see some of the benefits behind it. But I really wonder why do we need it? This thing is really simple, and some people don't want GNOME, so the... Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> we, cannot, we cannot say, okay, this, this acts like uh, some sort of library preloader so that everything is swapped in, and we don't have to load from... Yes? <laughs> Okay, so, so do you hate, uh, do you hate uh, handicapped people? Do you hate people who do not speak English? Do you only care about your own use case for GDM? Because there is this thing, um, GDM needs to be a full session for a couple of reasons. First of all, we need to start screen readers. We need to start all kind of other accessibility stuff because that is re needed for accessibility. Um, a screen reader pulls in an audio stack because you actually need to play audio. That basically pulls in Pulse Audio. Pulse Audio might even pull in uh, Bluetooth um, and, and the Bluetooth stuff. Um, if you log in on the network, um, then you actually need to, to sometimes download the LDAP um, user list and stuff like that. How are you going to, to, to access the network if you're not running something like the Network Manager applet? Um, Why do you need the Network Manager? <laughs> Static well, configuration. You know, you, you, yeah, well, um, I'm not sure in, in what world you live, but uh, um, we mostly live in a world nowadays <laughs> where things are on laptops and are being carried around. So, Actually, quite a few customers have asked for the ability that they can enable Network, the manage, man, network Manager applet there in the, in the session so that they can actually use that, so that they can actually log onto their own networks, which is actually a very, very common thing that people want to do with their computers, log into the network in the, in the well, business. Well, okay, then, I'm, then I'm going to talk about, about Network Manager. I will cover that. Okay, and then there's the next thing. In this session, a note, however... And accessibility. So not not only let's let's go on. There's localization. Um, for localization, you sometimes need input methods. Input methods are basically little applications you yes, start. Yes, but you don't if need you a full-blown session for that. Oh, absolutely, you do. If you if you pull all this together, you need Bluetooth, you need Pulse Audio, you need Network Manager. Sometimes you need um, input methods. You need accessibility and all that kind of stuff. 
Do you know what shell scripts are? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. But, um... Well, well, I mean, come on, it's kind of a discussion he kind of likes us, don't you? So anyway, what I'm st telling you basically is, is um, if you collect all this, if you have to start all these things, but then I don't what do you have? Full you have something session. That, that resembles very much a full GNOME session, which is the only difference, that there is no GNOME panel. And then you say, uh, also, well, let's not forget that some customers do want to enable other stuff in, those, in these uh, GDM sessions. Yes, they do it, but I don't see why we'll need a full blown well, GNOME session. Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of already explained it to you because you need to, to have no, start all you said What you, is a GNOME session what you for you? Told me was it is just starting a couple programs of programs. Started. You just gave me a list of programs started, and the only excuse I see is, oh, I want to do this through desktop files. So I, I have my. I, I don't think you have the slightest idea what a session is actually. A starting GNOME session is just a way to starting like to ten programs or whatever you ever have configured, and that is very much configurable, and that is very much by default the stuff I listed, and that's all there is in a session. If you if you call a session that you want to start a GNOME panel and metacity and other stuff, that does not happen in in uh, in, in the GDM session. So um, I'm sorry, but there's no way around that. Any any serious distribution that wants to 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 find serious customers will not run a GDM session anymore with a full deal. Because I mean, I mean, it's fine if you hate handicapped people and and people who don't speak English, but. I would well, like anyway. to continue, but I want to give him some rope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, then the new GDM, it will have, but at the moment it offers not as much configuration options than older versions. Well, arguable if you need them, it's just that way. So, uh, this is how it looks when you start the GDM binary in first time. So, the session, like we told you, it consists some by something like that. There is also Dbus. I didn't write it into the session into it because I don't think we need a Dbus for a session. I will talk about Dbus later. We can do it nicer. There, there are alternatives to Dbus. <laughs> so, uh, and then the GNOME Power Manager and Pulse Audio. Good. Pulse Audio for screen readers. I can't that answer. Why GNOME Power Manager? <laughs> No, no, I, I don't see it. Uh, why is the power management done by the session? This should be done well, on the system level. It's a question about policy. The GNOME Power Manager just employs the policy that is executed by the U Power stuff. Yes, yeah, by the U Power. But why do we so start it? If you if you if you boot up a computer, GDM is on you, and you and you close the display. Do you want to have it suspend or not? I mean, most people. Yes, but I don't suspended. need the power manager on my display. I can watch the state from another. Well, point. also, most of the time, you want to see this little uh, this thing on the right corner, which tells you how full the battery is, and then you need it. I'm sorry, but it's. Just, I mean, the GNOME power manager is just a tiny thing that applies the policy and shows an icon, and that's why we enable it because we want the policy in there because we want the machine to suspend if you have, are not logged in, and we want this little icon that tells how you. How long is your laptop on idle if you power it up? How long does it take until you log in? Well, um, I mean, come on, you're, you're in the university network. You should know that you have a gazillion of computers which um, most of the time just sit there wait, waiting for somebody to yes, log in. Yes, but those are normally desktop machines. <laughs> well, seriously, I mean, come on, we, we're shipping stuff for, for like everybody. I mean, you, you are welcome to, to disable the software on, on your machine, but um, we're trying to shipping something that, that actually works for everybody and, and supports everything and all kind of hardware. That's uh, really difficult to do, but that also has the effect, for example, that we do cater for accessibility and all this kind of stuff, even if you are not interested in it. Well, okay. Let's just say there is a reason for the home session. Then what about console kits? Now, I understand, no, 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 I understand the need for console kits. I'm perfectly okay with the whole intention of it. Uh, there's just one problem. It's not very well documented. This is on the homepage of console kits from the main documentation for now three years. I checked the internet archive and this was today. You can now... Go to this URL now, it's still standing, sta standing there. I've prepared it even here, so we can do a full cycle update. <laughs> and there you have it. 
So they, they don't even care to tell us what this is about. You have to find out yourself. So what it does is it's a seed-aware session manager. Uh, seed means I can, on a one single computer I can connect multiple input devices, multiple output devices, uh, all sorts of hardware, and these can be organized within groups where one user can log in and use them together. Um, so we need something that tracks the user and hands out permissions so that when I change the user from uh, a fast user switch, that one user doesn't see the things from another user. Uh, it uses Dbus for that. Dbus has its own wealth of problems. Problem is, console kit is broken. It's so broken that I, you don't even have to be a hacker to circumvent it. You can circumvent it by accident. Something is either process or a file. Now, in the case of console kit, we have persistent data stored in the process. It should belong in a file. Then the next thing, file permissions and ACLs are only applied upon the open system call. Once you've got an FD, what you set on the ACLs doesn't count anymore. This makes ConsoleKit easily circumvented, and if the daemon crashes, you're borked. Demonstration. <laughs> so this is the most recent Ubuntu 10.10. Installed it just a few days ago in a virtual machine. And here I SSH'd, on the right side I SSH'd into this uh, Ubuntu, so, and I have a look on the audio device. And who does it belong to? Uh, we have this main owner and group audio, and we see user GDM, so the GNOME Display Manager can play sounds on it. This, this nice, now GDM is available, or screen readers, or whatever. Now I change into the user piece. It's passwordless, so here's something. And now we see user piece got the permissions on the audio device. Now we can do a fast user switch to mission, and it gets the ACL changed. First GDM, and then mission. So let me open another SSH. So that I can um, so make me use a mission. And we are looking at the audio device. Uh, this applies to every device, also video devices, what else? So at the moment I'm use a mission and I can open the other mixer to control it. So, very well, everything all right. So, change back to peace. What was the password? Yes, so let's use a piece now. Also, mixer not available because the control file has its ACL changed. Now, other way around. Also, mixer open. Change back to mission. And now let's open here the. Uh, How can you guys work with this? <laughs> so, have the mixer to here too. Remember, this is the other user, user, this is mission. I can still operate on this device. Why? Because file permissions and ACLs don't apply. You can't do this afterwards. Now, imagine this not being the sound control. This is a, in the sound control, it's at best annoying. In the worst case, you're messing up someone's else recording. Now think about this being a video camera, and you're the old brother, and you want to spy on your little sister, or something like that. You just open a screen session, you open up a screen session, put a motion-aware uh, recorder there, have it sit there nicely, 
and we will record everything. And also, if the, daughter, uh, if the sister logs on and console kit <laughs> tries to put everything in place, he has still access to the device. So you can't do this by just switching the ACLs. Sorry about that. And talking about that, what happens if console kit crashes? Now we will just kill it. Uh, don't know the demon. Where is the process? You see, I don't use it on my own system, so I don't know it from heart. Here, console kit kill. Kill, nine. Now let's just crash it. So, console kit is away. Now I change back to, I want to change back to peace. First, mission still has the ACL moment. What's happening here? Why do I see a complete new login? You had a new session was opened. And now I go op uh, into my, and look what's running. Oh, there are two GNOME sessions for peace running. The fast user switch doesn't work once console kit crashed. And here's the problem. You can't, you shouldn't put persistent data into processes. Now, Leonard, I know in your system, D, you had this idea of putting ex extended attributes or something in the proc file system. Yes, but what if it crashes? Software can crash. And if you, if you put this stuff in a file, the well, daemon can silently restart, get its persistent data back. By the way, what you're criticizing there is not that console kit was broken. Linux is broken in that regard because we don't have the revoke system called it, the existence of Solaris. In fact, when, when John McCann, a good friend of mine and colleague who, who, who worked and created console kit worked on this, we were discussing all of this with the kernel people to get the revoke system called into the kernel. However, that never actually took place because it would turn out to be much, much more complex. But that is not an argument against console kit. That is just an argument maybe against Linux because we are still there. It, has a system call. It would be an argument against the whole Unix concept. But I don't see this whole It is not against Unix because, because it, it can be made work. work because yes, um, but all it breaks you need things. Is the Imagine call. you have a firmware update running. You can't just d interrupt a firmware update if some Serial devices are not covered by this. But this, maybe is for all, this is for audio devices and cameras and I a couple of I can't tell you things. people will apply to it. They have to configure it in UDEF, and uh, nobody does that. I mean, if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, you're welcome to, but uh, the default doesn't do that. And don't blame us if you want to shoot yourself in the foot. I mean, console kit doesn't kill people. People kill people. But then... Well, console kit may not be a weapon of mass destruction, well, but it, you know, console kit is in no way a policy um, enforcing daemon that would no be policy kit itself not, not, but it provides the tools. It just uh, provides notification that the, it, it changed who's in the foreground console. That's all it does. Okay, let me give. Don't you criticize console okay, kit for the fact that Linux let's doesn't go a step have forward. certain functionality. Um, let's st go step By the forward. Way, I do maintain uh, console kit. You know that, right? Yes, I know it. Uh, I'm. Um, what do you think about Wayland? I love it. So, uh, if I'm not completely mistaken, because I haven't looked too far into its implementation, but if I understand it right, you want to give direct access to dev input devices. So That's a plan. Yes. Now, here's the problem. I, I can open file descriptors on the dev input devices, so now you have to put things, and you're right, this belongs into the kernel. You have to set something into the kernel that you can take away people the ability to re read yes, from. The F revoke story is not, not over yet. Eventually it will come. Yes, but then let's do it right. Put something, the kernel knows namespaces. Let's add something like, uh, like process namespaces, let's something add console namespaces and organize the whole things like seeds and input devices in such console namespace in the kernel. Um, you know, console, managing things by console, access by console, is just one way to manage access. People do it in 
many different ways. Traditionally, it has been done with Unix group and whatever. And um, there's no point in, in, in raising that into anything higher. Also, I don't really buy that idea of namespaces for that. Because consoles are not a kernel object, really. They're kind of like a driver object. Oh, God, there are only really. 10 minutes left, and there's so many. To, OK, we have to. <laughs> OK, good. Um, then when we talk about console kits, uh, well, my advice is stick to the moment with PEM console. <laughs> It does everything what I need. Well, but then you don't have a problem with Revoke. Either you have it or you haven't, but there's no difference at all in the regards to Revoke and anything between PAM console and console kit. I mean, you, this is not fair. <laughs> at I least mean, we stop know. Stop bitching about what you want, but I mean, I don't, don't, don't uh, tell people that something is a solution that has exactly the same problems and a lot of more of them. <laughs> just, just say yes. No, no. Uh, Dbus. Now, Dbus is a very good idea. We have seen a lot of inter-process communication methods over the last years. Uh, lightweight ones and heavy white ones. I'm thinking more about the lightweight ones. There were inter-client exchange, Bonobo, Corba, Dcup. Uh, list could go on for pages. Uh, Dbus aims to replace all this. Very good idea. So the very first version, I still remember reading the initial release note, was something back 2002. Uh, I thought, yeah, that looks good. But uh, how this is, you start sticking features into such a system, and at some point you may have lost focus on it. And uh, I would clearly say I don't share the idea for such lightweight inter-process communication things with what people of Divas do. Uh, I don't think that everything is rainbows and unicorns. Uh, one thing I never liked about Divas is its uh, namespacing. So it does it like Java. Uh, you need a domain name. It's, uh, everything is all, all in the name of the, of the program or the domain. Uh, there are other methods to find your way around in Divas. Uh, but still, the, if you look into the programs and the source code, it's done all by these uh, identifiers of Dbus. I call this narcissistic namespaces, because the names don't tell you what these things actually do. Uh, then, with every name being self-defined, every program builds its own interface. So, the Dbus idea was we can do modules, we can make things in interchangeable. But now, if I look at the Dbus interface to Network Manager, it only works for Network Manager. I can't use the same front end for other network management systems. Uh, what if a name gets changed? Not, nothing unheard of. Ethereal was renamed Wireshark, VX Widgets, Windows was renamed VX Widgets. Uh, then you have to rewrite all the code using that. Mm, you can do this. I know there is that. Can be done. But there are other namespaces in Linux. I, I think SysFS, it's, it's perfectly clear. You can navigate it. Everything tells you what it does. <laughs> of all you said so far. Because SysFS has never been declared what it should be. I mean, I'm a good friend, uh, I'm good friend with Kai Zivas, um, who has actually implemented most of this together with Greg. And uh, SysFS has changed its, 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 its semantics like every, every half year since its inception. I'm not Divas talking about what hand, SysFS does, I'm talking about the namespace it, sp namespace it spans. It's completely chaos. I mean, they, they, they changed uh, from subsystem to, to, to bus and backwards and everything like that. This is not, I mean, both of this is actually just an implementation detail. Also, you should never forget that, that um, most applications have changed their APIs way more often than they have changed the names. So you do not have to, to, to uh, rewrite your stuff if you change the name because you will already have rewritten it ten times anyway. Well, so uh, I can go over SysFS with a set of very small rules and reg ex regular expressions, and even with the changing also, names, I have very old scripts which still read out SysFS very fine. Also, there are quite a few um, systems who actually use generic names. For example, I um, wrote a couple of specifications for Debus interfaces which do use completely generic names that everybody yes, can implement. Yes, it's possible, but it's... Uh, well, it's up to the developers what they want to do. I mean... 
Well, Divas does not enforce anything. Okay, Divas does not but, uh, okay, require you to use it. Uh, we uh, have, have only very five minutes. Okay, I want to cover this. Okay, Divas has TCP transport. Yes, but no authentication, no authorization, no encryption, and it's not really transparent. It is not a network protocol. End of story. Yes, but what about remote X, um, remote sessions? Well, we, multiple this, this is never, I mean, do you, if, you, if, you, if you log in via SSH into another server, usually what happens is that you get another SSH um, Dbus daemon on the other yes, server. Yes, but what if I do a remote? We do not, I mean, we, we had this discussion what to actually do about this, and it has been declared now, and this was mostly my work, okay, actually, but there are, that there Dbus are programs. will never be shared across the network, full stop. Yes. It does not have to be a network protocol. And that we declared this is mostly just um, we made official what the status quo was. It is not a network protocol. If you think it is, then it's your own fault. But then, Linux but, but then what you do is you take Linux desktop's network capability away. If well, you want we, to span the applications over I mean, multiple... I'm sorry, but we, the, the DBus has been around now since uh, five years, and it has never been sh network transparent. And it's, it's uh, sad that you noticed by now that we took that away from you, because um, it never was there. Okay, good. There's this TCP, TCP transport module. Okay, it's appreciated. But then, say you want to set up a X11 session spanning multiple hosts. Perfectly possible. We do it all the time with measurement systems. Uh, remote, uh, th there are these nice Lecro oscilloscopes which provide you SSH windows and all the stuff. Uh, doesn't work with, uh, there is no way to transfer Divas over it. Uh, then Divas tends to become uh, free desktop's hammer. So every time there's something to do about re controlling applications, it's done by Divas. And it's uh, just a transport. It's like it's using a, a socket. It's yes. a smarter socket. End of story. Yes, but a smart oh. socket, hands and forth. I don't. I think I don't like them. Status notifier items, this tray. I don't like it, but some people need it. And we have this old method of doing it with small X windows, which have this. Which no does not work at all because you don't have keyboard um, um, navigation. Nothing works in that way. It only looks pretty. It doesn't work. It doesn't do accessibility. It doesn't do internationalization. Not even keyboard no, uh, um, yes, navigation Yes, but you works. can leverage. There is a reason why do people do this. Um, sometimes it would be so helpful if you would actually ask people because we do not. I bite. asked. I asked on the on the free free okay, dot mailing list, and I got no reasonable. Well, ask the right people. I mean, not everybody's on every mailing list. I but asked I mean, on the I mailing list. You that, I, I mean, asked. Back. Next time, just ask me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I admit when I okay. I admit when I read the first answers on the mailing list, they had cognitive dissonance. But there is one important thing: once you get an answer, try to forget about it, read it two days later. And if you th still have cognitive di dissonance, then there's something right. But I thought, no, th th this doesn't make sense. So status notifier, skip it. We can do something very well. Instead of Dbus, we could use IP version six local multicast. No, we couldn't. Why not? <laughs> IPv6 does not provide almost anything that Dbus does. It, is, it, it reorders stuff. It drops stuff. It, um, does, does, the, the, uh, there is no, no nice way to actually match things by function call, and, and there is no policy. There is nothing. It is a completely, I mean, just because something is called multicast, and Dbus also does multicast, it doesn't mean it's the same thing. It's completely, completely different. I mean, we have been working on, 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 on porting uh, Dbus into other protocols, actually. Like, uh, for example, there's the, the work on, on, on moving it to, 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 uh, to some multicast AF Unix. But seriously? <laughs> Seriously, IPv6 is not the right thing for it because IPv6, after all, is a network uh, protocol and Divas is not. So it doesn't make any sense. Sorry. I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to. I want to dismiss these great ideas, but um, if you come up with a patch, we might consider it. Um, you know, by the way, that I also kind of maintain Divas. By the way. Yes, I know. <laughs> I think you do too much work. Well. Focus on one thing. <laughs> uh, policy kit, well, it, policy kit uses Dbus. Okay, when we say, okay, it doesn't use networking, then we can say, okay, we have Unix domain circuits secured. Uh, policy kit is often compared to sudo. Policy kit is not sudo. Sudo escalates your privileges by SUID. Policy kit uh, is, okay, we, I get to say that we skip it. Um, okay.
dann just Yes, okay. I will I <laughs> Uh, so, uh, <laughs> hell is that? <laughs> hell is that? I just added it. I just, I just added it because it's still in some distributions, and those people still using hell. I tell, please stop it. Do you agree? <laughs> We have deprecated it like two years ago or something like that, and we did all the work. But you to make see, it it's still uh, in the wild. Yeah, because KDE is a little bit slow, but that's not my problem. Yes, because <laughs> that's why I call it zombies. But, I mean, also, I don't, I don't really agree with the criticism on hell because when we did it, uh, there was no such thing it has existed before, and, and this was yeah, the one attempt out to figure out what we actually wanted to do. Yeah, but it, and it worked really well. It never worked for me. <laughs> Oh, it did. It, it enabled a lot of shit that never worked before. Okay, so last thing is uh, one of the things the Ubuntu guys and the distributor guys, and I think I read it on your blog too. What really pisses me off is this attitude to say, we provide you with the programs, you don't shall compile it yourself. You shall not build your system yourself. I don't understand this. We want open systems. What you're proclaiming is the exact opposite of open system. I'm and not proclaiming that. You can do what you want to do, but uh, I mean, you should know that, that it is my focus of work and that, that, that of my colleagues whose work you basically are criticizing here to actually produce a product and it's Fedora and it's RHEL and stuff like that. That's what we design for. We give you well stuff for Fedora. free. You're not, not, you're, not, I mean, you're not welcome to complain if we give you stuff for free. I mean, you can do whatever you, you want to do with it. But it gets harder and harder. Well, so, I'm, sorry for, that there, for example, I'm sorry that the, that the times change and things advance and, and that your mindset from the 1970s Unix is not up to date anymore. <laughs> but you know... Oh, I, I see lots of Unix lovers here. For this, for this, I have this. Those who don't understand Unix are doomed to reinvent it poorly. And the thing is, what happens is we are locking into certain technologies. Console kit, policy kit, now system D, real time kit. Uh, these things get interlocked and they limit us in the possibilities to replace things. You know, it's all free software. You can do with it what you want. You can yes, but if I it. try if to replace, like it, for example, system D, then it will break. We love patches. Yes, but I, what if I don't want system D, but if I want something completely different? Then you something completely different. I'm not forcing you to yes, do anything. Yes, but I have to emulate your interface. You don't have to. You can use whatever you want. You if can I stay don't do it, I, things will break. Sure, but I mean, I mean, either you want progress, <laughs> either you want progress, or you don't. What you want, you want progress in the area you're interested in, and no progress at all in everything else. I'm sorry that we don't give this to you. We, we do progress in the whole, whole thing. Well, okay, you live in your world, I live in my world. We will see yes, who will... Yes, we will see um, who, who, who advances Linux and who doesn't. Uh, no beer, no beer. Thank you. Uh, apparently, people. <laughs> apparently, some folks on the internet wanted to know who I am, but uh, so I'm Lennart Pettering, and uh, I actually happen to maintain quite a bit of the software, and I've wrote quite a bit of the software too. And. <laughs> I don't, I'm not in a misery, actually. Be kind, be kind to him. Actually, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, um, usually we don't get that much criticism. <laughs> it might actually surprise people, but actually people... Do you see how many that. people use alternate window managers here? <laughs> well, here! <laughs> You know, you know, this is the problem always that, that I mean, you need to think that, that, that Linux and, and then that all of this is much more than, than, than just your own use case. We have to, I mean, we have so many people who, who come to us and ask for things. Hmm? 
I mean, we, 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 we are being asked by so many customers and they have all, um, all kinds of interesting wishes and so many different people and we try, try to comply with all of them and that's what you get. I mean, nobody forces you to do, use anything of this, so, yeah. I mean, um, have you filed a bug? You don't like the, I mean, if you don't like the code, send us a patch. It's open source software. You get it for free. You get it completely for free. I, I just want you to love each other. Yes, I love everybody. <laughs>